Okay, so next we have uh, Pierre Longchamp, who is a engineer uh, from Australia, uh, speaking about risk management. Pierre? Hello. Hope everyone can hear me. Yes. Great. Do you have slides? <clears throat> or, or yeah. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yes, hope everything is working fine. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about risk management and thank you very much to the two previous speakers and it was a great quality talk and Michelle, you gave a, a great introduction for this talk uh, by concluding that risk management is one of the two things you need to include with every single application. Um, so I'm going to be presenting that in the context of open source medical device development and using ventilators as an example more than anything because I hope that everything that I will be saying can be useful for other type of products that many communities are working on during these times. Uh, so my, my background is uh, I work in the medical device industry. I've worked in a couple of small businesses where I do mostly product development, but I'm also now in charge of QA and RA in my company. Uh, I'm not a regulatory affairs professional at all. So I will rely a lot of time on professional advice from consultants and experts like Michelle. Um, and I'm also acting as a head of quality for helpful engineering, completely independently from my work, where I try to help many open source projects with all those aspects related to QA and RA. So I'll, I'll be splitting my talk in two parts. The first one being the why, doing risk management, and then we'll be talking about the how. So, so why first we need to clarify a little bit the context in which most of us are working, uh, where we have this sort of collision between two worlds. On one hand, we have these communities which are very strong on the concept of free and open source software, which are working non-for-profit and which are focusing on design and development of devices. And on the other hand, we have the industry, uh, which is based on principles generally of protected IP patents, strict licensing agreements, investment and profitability, and which are much more familiar with the regulation and all the level of responsibility, sorry for the typo, that comes with these regulations and this space we are evolving in. Uh, so the assumption we have made, at least at Helpful Engineering, and this context is evolving every day and every time we discuss that, we slightly change our approach. But it's to say that we will be working on giving the design away to other entities that belong into the industry side of things. Uh, these entities can be existing manufacturers. Potentially, they can be new manufacturers that are being formed and registered by members of the open source community who want to themselves hold their design up to the regulatory release and distribution, manufacturing, and really reaching the end users. Uh, of course, this raises a lot of challenges, really how to bridge this um, big gap between these two worlds. Uh, I just put a little screenshot at the bottom left with the yellow highlighting. That's the text of the CERN open source hardware license. Uh, which says that there's no implied warranty of satisfactory quality and no warranty of fitness for a particular purpose. Um, I, I chose this one because that's extremely accurate example of this chasm because that's the antithesis of what regulatory affairs means when you are talking about medical devices. Because all your QA and RA effort is meant to ensure satisfactory quality 
and to be able to prove and warranty that your product is fit for a particular purpose, which we call the intended use, so the term that Michel has used uh, quite a few times. So that's, that's indeed a big challenge. And I won't be able to give much answers today. <laughs> and I don't have those answers anyway. Uh, the little bit of an answer that I'll try to give is how to use risk management to potentially help and support this transition between two worlds. Um, so one may be asking, why not leave the whole lot of all these quality regulatory things that we, we as makers and volunteers are not used to? Why not leave that altogether to the manufacturer of record? I put the terms between brackets. That's what we chose to use that helpful engineering, but that's not a regulatory defined term. Um, so the first answer for that is ethics, I think. We all want to help, we all want to be helpful, and we all want to design products that are safe for proof of concept or designs or call them whatever you want. We all want them to be helpful and safe and risk management is a method to achieve that. Uh, one of the questions that was raised by another consultant working on us, with us on one of the projects was, ask yourself, would you use it on your own grammar? And Michel, in our previous talk, mentioned that some of the designs we are working on may not have to have any regulatory approval at all. They are not medical devices. I would say that even if they are not, and even if you don't have to, I really think all the teams should put in place some form of risk management to achieve the safety and efficacy and helpfulness uh, criteria. Uh, I think risk management is also a great mean and a great tool to achieve confidence and to improve the communication and documentation, both internally. Uh, you know, in our open source communities, a lot of people are not experienced at all with medical device. There's a lot of volatility of people walking in and out of projects. So it's very important to keep good records, to know where you are in the design. And using a risk management process is a great way to formalize this. Uh, in this process of designing products, you need to engage experts. You know, we had two experts talking just before on regulatory affairs and the clinical side of things. Whenever you want one of those experts to consult with you, it's good to have some reading material to give them beforehand so that you don't end up spending time repeating questions that have been addressed many times. When you have a risk management file or documents that explain where you stand in terms of risk analysis, that's a great support for communication. Uh, the same uh, usefulness of having a bunch of records will be great to give to the manufacturers you intend to take your project and release it. That will be a great starting point for them and will give them confidence that what you have done so far, it was their effort to push up further, rather than just giving them away a repository with manufacturing instructions or drawings. If they have the actual rationale of why you achieve those decisions, that increase the value of your proposal a lot. And Imagining really a worst case scenario, walking dead kind of things where COVID or another infectious disease takes us to a, such a dramatic situation that no one even cares anymore about getting any form of approval or regulatory or whatever. So the first thing a doctor want to do is not to do harm and trying a new technology, untested technology, unapproved technology. Having some risk management documentation is a great way also to convince doctors and end users that the device they may or may not want to use is safe to use and may not to harm. Uh, so beside of those aspects are still the regulatory world and regulatory requirements are the main reason why you need to do risk management, even in COVID and emergency. So I've had a few people tell me that yeah, but there's nowhere, nowhere in the EUA text says, we done anything about risk management. 
Uh, we're going to look into that a bit more in detail. So if you look into the text of the EUA, they list indeed our 20 or something standards. None of them is the standard for risk management. What they list are general, the blue ones that are more general standards. Then you have the collaterals that are standards that apply across all sorts of medical devices, but for a specific topic, like the one I have circled red covers uh, electromagnetic immunity kind of thing, and the biocompatibility kind of thing. And then you have the particulars, so the green circled one, which are all the ones specific to ventilators in that case. Uh, but there's nothing about risk management. ISO 14971 is not in this list of standards. Nevertheless, if you want to comply with those, for instance, 60601 and 62304, and the one about biocompatibilities, you have to have risk management. So even if the FDA did not write that in the list of requirements in the EUA, it's implied by the other standards they listed. Uh, if you look at the equivalent thing from the UK MHRA document, it's much more explicit this time. So ISO 14971 is in there. And the concept of risk management is spread in many different parts of this document. So it's definitely some things that you can't avoid. Now, what I found uh, interesting into all these EUAs and MHRA documents uh, is the use that are made of as applicable, likely, should, which are not terms that you see a lot in standard generally. You see much more shall and must, etc. Uh, so it's normal because those things are meant to adapt to an emergency situation in which you cannot just follow the usual red tape process. And when you think about what sort of process the regulators themselves will follow to identify what have to be done as opposed to the things that should be done but actually are not needed, they will be using a risk management process themselves, which will be focused on their policy rather than a device specifically. So for those reasons, these reasons, I believe risk management should be the first standard you aim at before you even want to dig into 60601 or 62304. You should be looking at 14971 and understand the process of risk management and start documenting it and applying it into your teams. Uh, so as we said, it's required anyway. It is what will allow you to identify the other technical standards that are the most relevant to you because they will be risk controls. And I put it my guess because it's not documented anywhere, but I believe that risk management is a process that the regulators follow to identify what has to be done or what could be maybe left aside uh, in a context of an emergency. Uh, that's true for the FDA, the UK, the member states of EU. Uh, I'm not sure about the regulation in the rest of the world. We have something about Brazil, I think, but I'm, I don't know a lot of country, but I'm sure all of them will follow the same sort of logic. So using risk management will allow you to build documentation that use the same language anyway, then the regulator would be using themselves and expecting to be able to build a good case for an emergency device. So now going into the how. So the, the how doing risk management in a medical device context is given by the ISO standard 14971. Uh, there's many versions because this standard is then harmonized by the countries that makes it, that recognize it. So sometimes you just see ISO, sometimes you see a British standard or this one was the Irish standard or the EN and various names in top of, of the name. It doesn't really matter, there's some minor differences, but I won't enter that today. Same thing for the year of issues. There are differences, but we won't discuss that. That's not a product standard. That's a standard that explain how to do the process of risk management. There's a great document that is uh, 
technical report 24971, which is really a guidance that gives a lot, a lot of example and explanation on how implement the standard itself. So it's a great document to have too. So these are copyright material, copyrighted material. Uh, in normal time, you'd have to pay for the standards, which is a couple of hundred dollars. During COVID, you can get it for free in various sources. I couldn't find the link uh, when I was preparing my slides, but you can join me on Slack and I can help you find it. The technical report officially is not free, but definitely there are copies around on some websites. Uh, so that can be a great resource. I'll start by a screenshot of the definitions are given as given by the standard. Uh, so the fact that risk management is a process, uh, meaning policies and procedures and practices for analyzing, evaluating, controlling, and monitoring risk. So the standard also define what is risk, which is a combination of probability and severity, the concept of harm, which is pretty obvious. Uh, so it's the analysis, which is the fact of identifying the hazards and to estimate the risk. The evaluation is the comparison of this estimated risk against a given risk criteria and this comparison let you decide whether risk is acceptable or not. And risk control, which is decisions that are made and implemented to reduce the risk within specified level, meaning within acceptable level. The um, hazardous situation uh, is defining a situation in which the so property, environment, or people, of course, that's the main focus of medical devices, would get exposed to one or more hazards. Uh, so risk management process, as uh, mandated by ISO 14971, wants manufacturer to design also for reasonably foreseeable misuse. And that's a very important concept to take into account uh, that is relatively recent in those standards. The older version didn't have that. Um, it's very important to design for that. Residual risk is what remain after having implemented the risk controls. And just another vocabulary term, risk assessment is both risk analysis and risk evaluation. Uh, so as I said, 14971 is a process, not a product standard. So that this whole process of analysis, evaluation, control, evaluation of overall residual risk, review and post-production activities. So in this context of community manufacturers, of course, we can't expect to conclude all this process and it will, someone else will have to finish it. The so first of those activities, it was the planning, which is this vertical bar. So I won't go into all the criteria from the standards, uh, but definitely the most important to me is to define the scope, to define the responsibilities. And that's something that I don't see much into all the documents produced so far to stand for yourself and to write your name on documents that are written and to clarify who is making the decision. Uh, you need to establish risk acceptability and we'll get to that later. Uh, to identify who will be involved into reviews. And I'd say I haven't seen much risk management plan at all so far. Uh, you have to do it and start and update it when needed. Don't not do it because you think you're not ready yet. Start doing it anyway. And even the standard itself mentioned it, that's not number four. That it's better to start with a part and then to complement later than not to do it. You can join us on the helpful QMS where we have resources that can help you write this plan and put electronic signatures and the like on it. Um, so the first step after 
planning is to analyze, which means to identify all the hazards and hazardous situation. And to do that properly, you need to define further again your intended use, uh, whether you are developing accessories, etc. To classify your product, and I'll explain later why. And here you can, once you have done that, you can start thinking about foreseeable misuse. Uh, again, on RQMS, we have some resources, this table to identify risk characteristics. So there's a lot of other resources which has uh, incident database that typically we use in the industry to get inspiration of risk and hazards. Uh, you can look at professional bodies publication. You want to involve experts. You want to do that according both a bottom-up and a top-down approach. You know, looking at the products as a black box or doing an FMEA, for instance, and looking at all the components. So there's a lot of further resources to do that uh, that are given in the standard itself that give you checklist and list of um, fields that you want to look your product and under this sort of scope, you know, looking at the energy, looking at the materials. And as part of the analysis, you also do your estimation. So you need to rank everything according to a severity and a probability scale. I really encourage people not to focus at all about uh, quantitative scales. Um, that lead to useless discussion. And I think it's much more important to focus on getting a comprehensive view of the product to list as many hazards as you can, rather than spending time discussing if that's a severity two or a severity three. Uh, and generally, you can't do everything into one table for a product like a ventilator. It's too complex, and you probably want to have different documents for different point of view on the product. If you do an FMEA, that's one thing. If you want to do a more of a black box approach, looking at the use and misuse and this kind of thing, you would do a different analysis. If you try to put everything in the same table, that becomes very messy and very hard to keep consistency in your ratings. Uh, so what is called evaluation then? Is a comparison to the risk acceptability, acceptability criteria that you had established earlier in the plan. So that means practically drawing this table um, or another version of those tables with as many degrees as you want and identifying the dark area, which are risks that are severe and probable as opposed to risks that are improbable and negligible and to define two or three areas of non-acceptable on the top right as opposed to acceptable on the bottom left. And whatever ends up in the top right area needs to be mitigated by risk controls so that you will identify to mitigate those risks and lower them into the acceptable region. You always want to favor inherent safe design rather than protective measures and information and training. So there's this example that is given actually in the 24971 about mechanical ventilators. That is a very good example. And that's where technical standards come back in place as well, because they are great risk controls. If you're working on an electrical thing, you want to make sure you're safe in terms of electrifying users and operators. So that's when 60601 tells, gives you both construction requirements and testing requirements. And in our context of open source, we may not have the resources to be able to test to 60601 in a proper lab. But because we have the construction requirements and we identified them doing a risk management, we can be confident that we are most likely to pass the test later on if a manufacturer is willing to pay for this test. Uh, so implementing those risk controls will mean different de design features and sometimes documentation. All these need to be verified for implementation and for effectiveness. And I think one of the next speakers will be talking about design controls, how to do that. Uh, there can be a lot of expert judgment as well as testing to do that. You want to be traceable, so you want to have a means of keeping traceability matrix between your hazard and your risk controls, and then the design features that implement them. Uh, 
as part of your control, you need to evaluate your residual risks. So what is making sure that the risks that were not acceptable are now acceptable and to do a risk benefit analysis for all the risks, even the ones that are acceptable. Because they exist, you have to document and to document a risk benefit, whether the benefit of using your device is worth those risks. And to make sure the risk controls you have implemented are not raising new risks. Uh, I'll skip this one because of time, but definitely in our scope, the post-production thing will not be done by our communities. So practically, there's many different technical methods to do that. Uh, there's not a single one that is better than another. Uh, I recommend people to use whatever they are comfortable with or already trained with, rather than trying to use something else they are not comfortable with. The traceability is definitely a challenge. Again, I don't have a great one size fits all solution to recommend. If you have money, you can buy a commercial solution. Rendmine, as something I've been using, is not super easy to configure and deploy, but it can be very useful. And document everything, identify who's writing what, implement version control and reviews. And again, at helpful, we can help you with that. So, quick word about software. Uh, so the standard trust software is IEC 62304 that refers to Ford 971 with a couple of specific points. So you just rate severity, not probability. Uh, you have a specific uh, scale that is given in terms of severity. That's called a safety class. Uh, to be honest, I think all ventilators related software will be classified as class C, which is the highest one, which means you will have to implement uh, documented units both in terms of requir requirements for your individual units and testing. And something that bounces back on what Michel was saying earlier is that you can't design the software in independently from the hardware system that it will be a part of. And you need to consider that all the time when writing risk management, implementing risk control measures, et cetera, et cetera. A uh, couple of points, so I think you really want to involve experts, have multiple reviews all the time with clinical experts, regulatory experts, technical experts. Uh, there's a lot of myths that are turning around that you can so warn your way out of anything by writing you know, the disclosures and warnings and things. That may be used to be more true, it's definitely not true anymore. Uh, so you really need to address the risk, not just to tell people not to use your product for what it's designed for. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis lately on usability. Part of the reason being that you need to design for foreseeable misuse. Uh, there's a standard that we haven't discussed in this scope that can help you a lot with that. Uh, 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 I didn't discuss alarms, of course, discuss that, but in terms of risks, that's a fantastic topic to consider. Hey, oh, yeah. Okay. Just one Last minute. Last one, sorry. Yep. So I think, no, I, I really hope people start doing whatever they can for risk management. Um, whatever you do, it will be better than nothing. Um, whatever you do, document it. If, if it's not written, it doesn't exist. Uh, if you can go one step further, write a plan describing what you are doing, even if it does not follow 14971 at all, or just a little bit, that's great. Write a plan and put your name on it. And be agile. Every, everyone in this community loves being agile. Be it for that and update your plan and your document often. And the rest is a reminder, so I can't keep that. So yeah, check the standard itself. And join us on Slack at Helpful Engineering. We have all these resources we mentioned. We have a few templates. We can help you with electronic document signature and this sort of thing. Um, and that's it for today. Great. I think that was really informative, Pierre. Thank you so much. We only had one question, which I think you did answer. What was a good risk management framework or application? And, and there are a few online uh, online applications, some software. Um, most of that is quite expensive, like Pierre said. 
Um, would you recommend just keeping sort of a, a uh, you know, Google Docs and things like that in an organized form and that would be okay? Uh, d definitely as a pro man solution, no, use a spreadsheet and you can use the automatic function of your spreadsheet to give a unique number to each of your hazards uh -huh. and then use this number as a reference uh, relating to your uh, risk controls and keep, keep this link in a matrix, you know, what, what number hazard is addressed by what number risk, uh, sorry, by what number controls of this sort of thing. So it, it can be a manual spreadsheet. Uh, I have been using myself when mine to do that, uh, but I found it lately very hard to maintain. Uh, people skill that IT can definitely help with that. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Pierre. That was really useful. And, and again, if you have any um, more need to see the documentation or talk to Pierre, he's always available at the Helpful Engineering Slack channel uh, QA-RA.